Hello, welcome to Modesto Sound. Today we are overviewing the setup and operation of our Allen & Heath QU16 digital mixer as well as the AB168 digital snake. So, our mixer comes in a SKB case like this. It's got wheels on the bottom and a handle on the top so we can get it where we need to go. But when we get to a show, we have to set it up. So let me show you how the setup for this mixer works. So first step is we're going to set it flat on the ground. Open it up, but only part way. All we need to do with this step is take the legs out of the lid. So there's four legs that are stored in the lid. We're going to close it back up again. Set it up on its wheels and then screw the legs in. The legs are at a little bit of an angle here, so it's kind of tricky to make sure it gets threaded on. You just have to get it at the perfect angle and keep spinning it. So you kind of have to adjust the angle as you're spinning it to get it to thread onto there. For the bottom ones, you kind of have to tilt it back like that a little bit, so it's a good idea to put the top two on first. And now all the legs are attached. So now the next thing we're going to do, we want to get it into a position where we want it to be, and we want to flip it up on its feet. You can do this with two people. You can do it with one people, but uh, you just have to flip it up. If it was two people, you'd have somebody lifting up from the back like that. Okay. So now we've got the legs on the mixer. We can take the lid off completely. So open it back up. And this part slides up and off. And that can be set out of the way. And now the next step is we're going to pull this up and we're going to pull this all the way up and now when we're up here we need to insert these two pins into this slot right on the side here one on each side and then we're good to go so now with the mixer turned around we can see the back of it and where what stuff we have inside of here. So when we open it up, we put those pins in, this mixer is standing up, we have some things inside of the case here. First and most important is our IEC power cable. We're going to need that. But we also have a uh, bag here that holds our iPad for remote control. So that's going to be important. We'll take that out and look at it later. Uh, the other components in this case, there's a little bag which is storing a microphone with a switch on it we use for talkback, an XLR cable for the talkback mic, a roll of tape, white artist console tape for labeling cables and or changing inputs and labeling the inputs on the mixer, and there's also a parts brush in here so we can dust off the mixer before and after use and just keep it clean and free of dust. The other things inside of this case don't move. They're attached to the case itself, but we have a wireless router with some antenna on it here that is what allows us to connect to our iPad for remote control. We also have a Bluetooth receiver right here and that is what allows us to connect our phones to plug into the mixer so we can play house music or other audio. Uh, there's also a charger in here for any type of device including our iPad or phone or whatever and uh, that's it. So we're going to plug in our power cable as the first thing. 
and right here on the back of the mixer, it's labeled AC in, that's where the power for the mixer and all the accessories gets plugged in. So you have to pull down the flap, plug that in, and flip this switch on the power strip, everything turns on, we're good to go. Okay, so when you first power up the Allen Heath QU16, it will be in whatever state the previous user left it in. So if they were running a show and they had all their faders and they had all their channels set at different things, we want to reset that back to nothing. So the first step is we're going to push the scene button here to the right of the screen and we're going to load our default scene. We have two choices for the default scene. Option number one is default local, which means it's using the local inputs on the back of the mixer. And option number two is default dsnake. That's what we use if we are using our AB16 digital snake to plug into a stage far away. We would only use the local if we were either doing like a very small show where we didn't need the mixer far away or we had the mixer on stage like next to the band because we didn't have a place where we could run the snake so most of the time we'll be loading default D snake so you select it over here you can also scroll up and down through all of the scenes here and then once you have it highlighted in yellow you push recall it asks you to confirm, do you want to recall default D snake? Yes, we do. Now it has loaded the scene. So now that we have our scene loaded, we're going to go over some of the settings that we can change on here. So 90% of the time when we're using the mixer, we're going to have this top processing green button pushed in and that is just a view that shows us what we're affecting each channel or mix with. And that's where we want to be, is pretty much this green processing button. The grouting button does some stuff that you don't really need to worry about. The home button by the screen is uh, where we get to our shutdown. We'll talk about that later. Uh, we also have the RTA and spectrogram which are some handy tools that you might want to use and our QU drive USB recording is here so we can record the stereo mix from the main output or we can record multi-track all of the input channels so all of these options are in the home button the next button by the screen is FX that's where we can change some of our effects parameters for our reverb and our delay. Uh, the next button was scenes, which you already saw, where we load our scene and where we can save our scenes after we sound check. Uh, the next button is sound is setup. And you won't really need to use any of these options either. That's kind of some more advanced setup things. So you shouldn't really need to touch anything in the setup menu. So 90% of the time or more will be in the processing screen. So the processing screen shows us what we're doing to any channel, where the channel's coming from, and which channel we have selected. Selected. So I guess a, first an overview of the surface of the mixer here. So we have up here, this is what Alan Heath calls their super strip, which is their channel strip controls. Uh, we have our channels across the front, 1 through 16 uh, channel faders, and we have labels at the bottom on this uh, label that shows us what our default scene inputs are. And we can always change that 
but the default scene is going to stay labeled on here because most bands and shows we do will fit into this scene. Sometimes we'll have to change things, not always. So for an individual channel, so channel one here, we have the kick as it's labeled here. We have a select button. That button selects the channel. It highlights it's a green button and the green LED turns on when you push it. And that selects the channel so it shows up in the screen, on the processing screen, which channel we have selected. It says channel one right there. Select channel two, now it says channel two snare. Uh, above that is a mute switch for that channel. Lights up bright red when you have a channel muted. That mute switch mutes that channel not only to the main output, but also to any uh, monitors or FX sends as well. So that mutes the channel to every output. Underneath the select key for every channel, we have the PAFL switch. Uh, that button is basically a solo button, as it is on other mixers. It might have solo. Uh, on here, PAFL stands for pre or after fade listen. And that means it's taking this channel and soloing the output from that channel to both our meter right here. Notice the uh, red PAFL light lights up when we push, when any channel is selected. And it also solos that to our headphone output right here. So we can solo one channel and see where the input level is on a meter. And that's very handy for both checking gain when we're setting the gain for a channel, making sure that it just hits the yellows, stays out of the reds, and also for tuning in and listening to individual inputs during a show if there was some sort of weird sound or something is going wrong, maybe there's a feedback and we want to solo that channel to make sure that that's where it's coming from. So that's what the PAFL does. The PAFL also works for our main mix over here. We can solo that. By default, our headphone output is the main mix. So that's what you'll see on this meter. So our mixes over here on the right side of the mixer. By default, the LR blue button will be selected here. And that means that when we turn these faders up, we're sending to the main mix. However, along the right side, we have additional mixes. We have this one, it says FX1, and it's labeled as reverb. That is our reverb send. So if we wanted to apply reverb to a vocal channel, we would put it there. Uh, next up, FX2 is labeled as delay. If we want to apply delay. And then after that, we have mix one, mix two, mix three, mix four. Uh, we don't use these other ones. Those are additional mixes. But all of these four mixes are our monitor mixes. So those are equivalent to an auxiliary send. And they are pre-fade aux send because we're sending the channels to the monitors before they get to the main mix. So you can see which this is labeled as stage right monitor. And also you can see on the screen here when I select it, it says mix one SR mon. Same thing, center mon, stage left monitor, and drum monitor. So those are our four monitor mixes. And like I said, we can solo the monitor mix as well if you want to listen on your headphones to what is coming out of one of those monitors, you can do that with the PAFL switch. In this case, it's an after fade listen. So it will be after the master fader here. All right, so more about the control surface and what we're looking at here. One very important thing to know is 
that these faders are labeled with the channel at the top here. There's also a second layer of things that the, that the faders will do. So this is additional inputs with this blue light lit up. That's stereo one, stereo two. Those are quarter inch inputs on the back of the mixer. We don't really need those. Stereo three is this input right here, but right now it's plugged into our Bluetooth receiver. So our house music would come from that input. So it's important to know that on the mixer, in order to get to that one, you have to push this layer button to get to the second layer. Also on the second layer, we have our FX returns for our reverb and our delay. We also have the send masters here. So that's for every mix, including the effect one and two reverb and delay, and then monitor one, two, three, four. So you can just see where the master faders are for that mix. So one thing to, I can push this and now I'm on mix one. If I turn ma mix one master down, it's the same exact thing right here. So if I went, went to mix two, mix two, mix three, same thing. So it's just a way to have all of those in one place versus having to select it over here. And you won't really need to adjust the monitor masters very often. Back to layer one, that's all of our inputs. So channels one through 16, either from the local input or from our D snake. Uh, so we'll go over the rest of the controls for the channel. So first you have to select a channel and now make sure you're on the processing screen right there. And now the screen will show us a lot of information about our channel. First of all, you can see the channel number that's selected. You can see the name of the channel it says kick drum or it says kick. This is easy to change. If we want to change the channel name, we just tap right there. And now we can type in a new name for that channel. Well, not though. It's the kick drum. Uh, the next thing you see is the preamp gain, which is also represented by this knob on the mixer. So if I turn this knob, it turns that display right there. Anything on the touch screen, if you want to control it, you can just tap on it. Oops, I missed. And that selects it. And now this black knob underneath the screen will control that. So usually it highlights in orange when you tap on it. So anything that's available you can click on and anything that highlights in orange, you can turn the knob to change. Our next controls on here, we have 48V for phantom power. And notice it says in parentheses, really tiny hold. So I can't just turn that on by pushing it. They want to be extra safe. So in action, to turn it on, you have to hold the button down for a couple seconds. And notice when you turn it on, it lights up red and it also lights up a 48V uh, little text right there. Uh, under that is the pad. That is a 20 decibel pad on the preamp. And that is actually only available when you're using the D-Snake. So on the mixer itself, the preamp gain goes down to minus 5 dB and all the way up to 60, I think. On this, you can turn the preamp down to 5 dB, but if you add the pad, now we're at minus 15. So that should be plenty for a very hot input. And it goes all the way up to 60 dB. So that will handle anything. You shouldn't ever really need to be or as close to 60 dB. Pretty much everything will be at 20 dB and lower. Uh, sometimes you'll need to go a little bit higher for other kinds of inputs. We have a polarity invert key. 
that's important if you have multiple microphones on one source, uh, such as a snare top and a snare bottom. You would, might invert the polarity to get them to line up and have a better relationship between the two signals. We also have delay for every single input. That's also useful for aligning inputs in time and that goes all the way up to 85 milliseconds. We don't really need to use either of this thing because we don't have a snare bottom mic, we'll just have a snare top mic. So neither of those things are very necessary for our purposes. One thing that's also good to know is this blue teal FN button here it does whatever it says on the screen in that bottom left corner. So right now it says on the screen source. So if I push that button, now we can choose the source where that input is coming from. So remember when we loaded the scene, we loaded the D snake scene. All that, the only difference between those two scenes is the source selection here. So one thing that's, uh, good to know is when you have the D snake selected it's yellow the preamp knob is yellow if you have a local input selected that means the actual input on the back of the mixer now our preamp knob is red and there's actually one more you can select USB and now our input knob is blue our gain knob is blue so if you select a channel and it's like, oh, why isn't it working? Why is there no channels? No, nothing's coming in anywhere. Maybe you accidentally loaded the wrong scene and you have all your D snakes when you're using the local input. So you have everything as a local input when you're using the D snake. You just want to make sure that that knob is the right color and uh, you're good to go. So moving on with the controls. We have separate sections on this screen. So this first one is the channel controls overview. That's where we change our source, our gain, our pad, our phantom power. Next up on the screen we have a gate. So those are controls for our gate. Uh, on the control surface of the mixer itself we have a knob for threshold and we have an in-out switch. We can turn that on or off. Uh, we have the gate applied to the kick and the tom microphones, but nowhere else. It's not really necessary, it just helps to clean up a little bit of noise. So if you know how that works, you can use that. Next up is very important, is the parametric equalizer. And this EQ has already been set up for the kick drum. And you'll see if you select any of the channels, they might have no equalization. They might have a basic default EQ. They're very minimal. We don't want to use the EQ too much as a crutch to make sounds the way we want them to be. We just want to move the mic in the right place to get the right sound. So our kick drum EQ is one of the most dramatic ones that we use because we really want that extra low boom and we want a little bit of click on the high end and nothing much in the middle. So our EQ controls on this mixer consist of these 12 knobs which uh, correspond to gain, frequency, and width for four different bands of the parametric EQ. So this one labeled LF for low frequency is represented on the screen by that green bump. So we can change the frequency, scoot it back and forth. We can change the width, make it very narrow or very wide, and we can change the gain. Amplify or attenuate that band. For a kick drum, that's where we find our, our fundamental bottom note on the kick drum. It's usually somewhere around 80 hertz. And we want a pretty decent bump there. Next up is the next band, same thing. So maybe we want to cut more out of the middle of the kick drum because there's a lot of uh, bleed coming through or just it's muddying up the mix. So we can do that. We can make it a bigger cut.
Any of these controls can also be selected with the touch and turn knob on the screen here. So you tap on the screen and now I'm controlling my bandwidth with, with this knob. Same thing as turning the knob over here, just maybe easier to see. Uh, I find these ones easy because you can just grab it. There's one for every band, but if you're unclear, you can kind of go to here and tap on whatever you want to change. Another important control that is related to the EQ is our high pass filter. Our high pass filter is right here in purple on the screen. Also has its own dedicated knob and switch over here underneath the preamp gain. So you can turn the high pass filter off or on, or as the switch says, in or out. And you can sweep the frequency all the way from 20 hertz. You can sweep it all the way up to two kilohertz. Uh, for a kick drum, well, we want to keep that really low. We want that to be around 20 or 30 hertz. But you can see it represented on the screen by this purple line moving up and down here. So for kick drum and a bass instrument, we want that to be really low. But if I select a different channel here and you look at what that frequency is, so for the snare drum, we're about 80 hertz. For the toms, we're about the same place. Uh, the overhead is all the way up to 175 hertz. And bass is really low. Amplifiers at 90 hertz and our vocals are at 130 hertz is where we set our high pass filter to cut out all the low end mud from those channels. Uh, that can be adjusted if you think there's more in the low end that you need or more often if there's if you need less low end. If there's too much mud you can push it up higher. So with a vocal channel here we can just move that up. Maybe it's a soprano singer and they don't have any low notes that would be below that. You can push this all the way up to 200. That I find especially useful in a speaking situation where somebody may not have the best microphone technique and you're really trying to fight with feedback. So you want to really narrow that frequency that you're reproducing down. So you can push that all the way up to like 250. And that way you don't have to worry about any low frequencies feeding back and then you just have to cut around with the high ones to find where it does feed back. Also on our super strip control as Alan and Heath has designated these controls equivalent to the channel strip on an analog mixer just uh, in a different layout. So you have to select your channel and now you have all of these controls. So next up we covered the preamp gain, high pass filter, parametric EQ, we talked about the gate, uh, we also have a compressor threshold. So on our processing screen if we just tap there where it says comp on the right side now we can see all of our compressor settings for this particular channel. This knob underneath the compressor here that controls our threshold. So that's the main control that we have for our compressor. And we have a in-out switch. So we can turn it off or turn it back on. Same thing as right here and threshold is the same thing as right there. But now that we're on the compressor screen we can also change the ratio of the compressor. We can add makeup gain and we can change the attack and release of the compressor. For all of these inputs, the default settings should be pretty good for whatever is coming into the vocal channel or the kick drum or the bass. I believe only a few of the channels actually have compressors applied to them. So I think the bass has kind of like a soft knee compressor there that just evens out the volume. Kick drum has optional compressor to uh, get some more bump out of it, but that starts in the off position. And the vocals have compressor to 
take down the level of any loud yelling vocal parts and make that more equal to the level of the quiet vocal passages. So the default setting should be good here. The only thing you might need to do is actually adjust the compressor threshold. So that's why this knob is the knob that they decided to make that. So if the singer is singing quietly and they are not hitting that compressor threshold, you might need to boost the gain for their microphone. Or if you have that already set and you have your monitors all mixed already and that's everything the way it needs to be, you might just turn the threshold down so that they do start hitting that threshold and evening out their vocal level. All right, uh, important control, very important control on the mixer are these soft keys on the right side. So these keys can be assigned to any function within the mixer, but the way we have it set it up and locked to the setup is we are using these for our mute groups. So this one, soft one, is labeled mute instrument. So if I push that in, channels one through 12, the mute starts flashing. So that means that those are muted. They're muted because they're included in that mute group. If I push soft two, mute vox for vocals, now the remaining channels, 13 through 16 are muted. Note that if we go to layer two, our Bluetooth input is not muted. So if we have house music playing, it will not be muted by these. And that's what we want. This is what we push in between bands or during a changeover or a break or something. And I have it separated into two separate mute groups because a lot of times when a show's over or when a set's over, you'll want to mute the instruments, but maybe somebody still has something to say on the microphone. So you have to keep that microphone open so maybe they can make an announcement or there's an MC who's gonna speak. And there might be multiple people even talking too, so you want to keep all the, the vocal mics going. Right. Because they could grab whatever mic. Uh-huh, yeah, and they're gonna, if you have everything muted and somebody tries to talk to a mic and they're like, what, 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 to check, check, why is the mic not working? Uh, so it's a good idea to just mute all of the instruments so that way they can unplug their keyboards and guitars and uh, do all the things that they want to tear that down but still be able to talk to the audience with the vocal mics. When you push a mute switch, when a channel is muted, via the mute switch, the mute light flashes red. When a channel is muted on its own, the mute light stays a solid red. And a good function of this mixer versus other mixers, different digital mixers have different behaviors for mute groups. This one is the one that I like the best. So if you have channels muted, and then you mute them with a mute group, notice that these three channels are flashing differently. They're still flashing, but they have a different pattern to their flash. And what that means is they're muted twice. They're muted via the channel, and they're muted via the mute group. So if I unmute the mute group, those channels remain muted, which is great, because if you push the individual mute on a channel, it stays muted, whether you turn the mute group on and off, however many times you turn it on and off, those channels remain muted. Other mixers have, like, a, if you mute it and then unmute it, it grabs those and unmutes them as well. If there's only one state, and that is not good because maybe you want those channels to stay off. So this behavior is preferred. The other soft key here is flashing. And that's not because it's muted, that's because it's using a different function, and this is a tap delay function. So, actually, if we tap this key, it flashes at the rate we tap it. So if I push it really slowly, now it's flashing really slowly. That's because that is our delay time. So, in order to get to the delay, we can either select this mix, 
to send to it and then push the select key for that mix and it brings it up here or alternatively we can push the FX view on the screen and then select FX2 and now we have the same thing so we can see tap tempo is set to 1.3 seconds if we push this button quicker now it says 313 milliseconds uh, so that's really handy for getting a delay to line up with the beat of the song that's being played. And that's a fun just added effect that you can do. Just like any other control on the screen, you can tap there and you can control it with the knob. All of these other controls, these high pass, low pass, feedback filter, feedback amount, that's important. If you want like a slap back with no feedback, you can turn that all the way down. If you want it to just keep going and going, you can turn it all the way up. That's fun sometimes, but be careful with that. So starts out as default in the middle. A reverb, so on FX1, we also have a number of parameters to change this. The main one you'll use is decay time. However, with this, we also have other types of reverbs we can use, and with the delay as well we can load in a new effect by pushing this library key. So the function key now is library. So if we push that, now we have a list of all the FX types and presets. So if we wanted to load in a different type of reverb for our FX1, we can select any of these reverb presets. There are a lot of them. We got a hall massive, so we highlight that, push recall, and now we have the massive hall, which has a decay time of 5.12 seconds. It's going to be a very long reverb. Okay, so this is the back of our Allen & Heath QU16 digital mixer. We have all of our local inputs and outputs here, as well as some other things that we may or may not use. Uh, so for our local inputs, we have 16 microphone inputs on XLR connections, 1 through 16. Every input also has a quarter inch connection that accepts either a TS or a TRS quarter inch cable, the balance connection or an unbalanced connection, 1 through 16. So those are for our line inputs. If we had to plug a keyboard or another mixer or some kind of line output device in, we might use that instead of using a DUI box and going into the microphone input. We also have our local outputs here beneath that, starting over here, mix one. This is all mix outputs. Mix one is going to our stage right monitor, as that label says. Mix two is our center monitor. Mix three, stage left monitor. Mix four is drum. These other ones aren't used and left, right are our main outputs. These will connect directly to our speaker or our subwoofer, and that'll be for the front of house mix. Next up, we also have another input here for our talkback microphone. So that dedicated input is where we plug our talkback microphone so we can talk to the musicians even though we may be 100 feet away at the front of house position, we can just turn on that mic and just go into their monitors. Uh, we also have the connector for the lamp, which usually stays plugged in here. So that can light up the mixer in a dark situation. And then there is a number of other connectors. These two are what we're using for our microphones for this video. So those are plugged into the local microphone inputs, and these alt outputs are going to the camera. We have a two-track output, which is the same exact mix as the left-right output, just coming out on a quarter-inch connector. We have an AES output, so that's actually a digital audio signal, and uh, it's only very specific and rare cases would you ever use that digital two-track out. Yeah, so. We won't worry about that, but one thing we 
do worry about is if you plug that into an analog input, it's not going to sound good. It's just going to be a really bad noise because it's trying to put out digital audio. Noise. Yeah. We have our stereo inputs here. So these are a line input on a quarter inch connector. Once again, that's either TS or TS unbalanced or TRS balanced connector and they're stereo. So you have left or mono and right. So if you have just one quarter inch, you can plug it into here. And the good thing about these is that they are in addition to all of the 16 input channels. So these actually stereo inputs are on the second layer of the inputs. And those just give us an additional input. So we could plug in a DJ or a CD player or a some kind of a audio input and not use up any of our 16 microphone input channels. But it must be a line level input. We have right here plugged in, this is our network connection. That is the ethernet connector that goes down to the wireless router in the case. We have a USB connector that is able to connect to a computer and we can use this digital mixer as an audio interface on a, using a USB connection to a computer. And then we also have this one, which is probably the one we're gonna use the most out of any of these connectors on the back, which is our D-Snake connector. So the D-Snake is our remote input output box for this mixer. So if we use the D-Snake, we don't have to use any of these analog local connections at all because all of these connections are replicated on the D-Snake box. So all we have to do is plug in one EtherCon cable right here, connect that to the D-Snake, and then all of our I.O. is on the other side. And remember, you have to change over to the D-Snake scene or switch your inputs to D-Snake rather than local. So we have our EtherCon cable, which is just a normal Ethernet cable with a special sh connector around it to make it more durable and able to uh, last longer. But it's just a regular Cat5e shielded twisted pair Ethernet cable. So that just plugs in just like an XLR. It clicks, so you have to push the button to unplug it. And then we can connect with our 100 feet to our D Snake on the stage. So with our new D-Snake, we can connect just to this single port right here. And that gives us remote access, once we plug in this other end, to all of our inputs and outputs. So instead of plugging in locally all of these microphone inputs and monitor outputs and speaker outputs, we just plug in this one connection and now we have 16 inputs and eight outputs on our remote digital snake unit. So we're gonna talk about that next. We're looking at our Allen Heath AB168 digital snake. And uh, this unit is our remote IO unit for the QU16 mixer. It has 16 inputs, and eight outputs, all on XLR connectors you can see nicely labeled to match the default scene on the mixer. We have inputs 1 through 16, two banks of 8. We also have outputs 1 through 4, 5 through 8. So output 1, that's monitor 1, stage right, monitor 2, center, monitor 3, stage left, monitor 4 for the drummer. Down here we have Output 7 for the left speaker, output 8 for the right speaker, output 6 for the sub. So the sub we can actually plug in two different ways. We can run our left right both into the sub and then go out from there. Or we can take this, because all this output is, the way it's set up on the mixer, is this output is just a sum of the left and right outputs summed together. So in order to connect this box, first if we look at this side, you'll notice that it's got a power cable attached to it. So it requires power. So we will 
give it what it wants. Plug it into power. And then it should turn on. There's a light on the front. And we also have to connect our EtherCon cable to here. This one actually has two different EtherCon connectors, uh, but this one is labeled two mixer. It says D Snake. It's got a white highlight around it. This one is expander. So that's if we had multiple units, you could hook into one and then into the other one. But all we need to plug into is this one. So we just take our EtherCon cable, plug it in there. Now we've made all the connections we need. And you can see that we have power and it's connected to the mixer. It's ready. Another thing you might notice on here is the red lights on a certain channels. So those red lights actually indicate phantom power is active on those channels. So that's a good thing to know that we're connected and our overhead channels have phantom power because the mixer was set up to send phantom power to those two channels. So one of the coolest things about this digital snake is that it is in fact digital. So before we were able to use something like a remote IO digital snake like this, in order to get your inputs and outputs onto stage, you would have to use an analog snake. And this has 16 inputs and eight outputs. So that's 24 channels total. For an analog snake, that is a whole lot of wires and you end up with like a big thick cable and a bunch of copper and it's very heavy and it's a hundred feet long because our cable here is a hundred feet long and uh, it's really hard to move around and coil up and it's just a big heavy thing to move around well guess what this can do all of that over a single Cat5 cable, like that. Very cool that we were able to transmit all of these channels of digital audio over a tiny little lightweight flexible cable that we can just wrap up and throw in the box afterwards versus lugging it around and having to lift it. The audio quality over this digital connection, it loses nothing. All we're doing is we're changing where our preamps are. Our preamps are actually inside of this box rather than being on the mixer. So we connect closer to the stage, convert to digital, and send that back to the control surface, which does all the math, sends the signal back, and converts it back to analog over here. So. There's less loss over the long, long copper cable run, less weight of hauling the cable around, and it's just a nice modular system that's very uh, handy and useful. And much less noise. And much less noisy than an analog snake. All right, so now that we learned a little bit about our digital mixer, we are going to set up a basic sound system with all of the components, including our main speaker and our monitor speaker, which we've got set up here just so you can see the uh, inputs and the amplifier controls. So first thing we're gonna do is hook up our digital snake. We've already got it powered on, and we just have to plug in the D snake input here. You watch. Ready. Phantom power is on. You heard some relays click over in there. This is good to go. So now, instead of plugging things in in the local outputs on the back of the mixer, all of our outputs are right here, which is on stage, counter, on stage, right here. So let's say that this monitor is monitor one. So this is gonna be our stage right monitor. So we're gonna plug in to the output for the stage right monitor, and we're gonna plug it into our powered speaker here. So there's input one. There's actually two XLR inputs on this monitor. Uh, we only need one. 
The two inputs is cool for other situations where you might not have a mixer and you just plug straight in and you can have two mics going in there. But for our situation, we just plug into one and we're going to make sure that the knob is at the zero position, so straight up at noon. That's where we want it to be. That's a unity gain input. Uh, now that because of these are powered monitors, we have to plug in our power as well. So power's plugged in. There's actually a, a handy little hole in the mixer so you can plug it in right there so it doesn't get unplugged if somebody trips on it and you just switch it on. So you'll see the uh, screen light up, it says the model name PXM12MP uh, and then everything's good to go. So now we can send signal to this monitor. Next up we're going to plug in our main speaker. So we need another XLR cable. We're going to come out of one of our main inputs. Uh, let's say this is our right speaker. So usually we'll be doing a stereo setup. Today we just have one speaker. So we're going to plug it in to the right output. And we're just going to plug in right there to input one. So same thing on this speaker. There's two inputs. We only need to plug into one of them. And we just need to make sure that that gain knob is at zero. Once again, we need power. So we'll hook up the power, flip the switch to turn it on. That's the Electro Voice Logo EKX12P. These speakers have a number of settings. Being a powered speaker, the amplifier is built into the speaker itself, as well as a number of digital signal processing configurations and processors. So this one has a big knob right here. They both have knobs. If you turn this knob, you'll actually see on the screen it says level plus five. So you can change the master gain with this knob. We always want that to be zero. So sometimes somebody might have touched it and you might see a different number. You might see plus five, you might see minus four, you might see minus 35. Why is there no sound coming in? Why is that speaker so quiet? It's because somebody touched that knob. For a default setting for any time we're using this, that level should be zero. This level should also be zero. We don't really need to change anything. Those should just stay where they are. Same thing over here on the monitor. Zero dB on screen, zero dB on this knob. This one actually locks, so you can't turn that knob until you push it, and then you can change the gain. But this one doesn't lock, unfortunately. It does lock to get to the other functions of the DSP. So these both, like I said, they have DSPs. They will be set up for a full range system with a subwoofer because that's our typical setup. With a subwoofer, we are cutting out the low frequency sounds that go to this speaker, but we can bring those back if we change our DSP preset here, go to sub and go to off. Now the low frequency sounds can just since still be reproduced by this speaker. So we would only need to do that if we're not bringing a subwoofer. If it's a very small show and there's just, we didn't need the low frequency, maybe it's just speaking, that we don't need a subwoofer for that, we can set that and have a full range speaker. But in most situations, we would have this set to EKX15SP because we'll have the subwoofer with it. There's a number of other settings. Nobody should have to change anything here. There's also a preset for Modesto Sound saved in here. So if you scroll down to Recall, push OK, there's a number of empties and there's also Modesto Sound. You can load that preset and that resets everything to where it should be. So that's our subwoofer, mode, live, location, tripod, 
Everything's flat, EQ. Perfect. So we're good to go. So let's start making some sound out of these things, huh? Cut. Cut. Alright, we've got our monitor and our main speaker plugged in, powered up. Notice that the monitor has a light on it to indicate that it's on. The main speaker also has a light there, but we have switched the function of that light to indicate when the speaker reaches its limiting threshold. So that light only lights up when this speaker is doing more than it should. So if you see that light flash on the main speaker, it means you should probably turn your main mix down a little bit or it's too loud. We switched that to the just on mode for the monitors because the musicians aren't going to know what that flashing light means. They just want to know that their speaker is turned on. So everything's plugged in. We have our digital mixer. We have our digital snake. So we want to hook up an input. So everything's labeled on here. Inputs 1 through 16 for drums, bass, amplifiers, DI's, and vocals. So we're going to plug into input number 16. That is our vocal 4 input. So, just plug in there. And plug into our microphone. This is the SEV7 microphone that we'll be using. And, now if we go here, select input 16. Now you can see that there is some signal happening. We're getting it through the digital snake and it's coming up in this channel. If I want to solo that channel, now you can see on the meters here, my voice is coming in through that and it's reaching uh, a good level, good enough level for this situation. We might want to adjust the gain to turn it up if I was just going to be speaking and I was only going to speak at a very low level like this. But for a singing situation, we usually want to have our microphone preamp gain set to around 20, 25 dB, somewhere around there. So the default setting on this scenes that we have set up is 24 dB. So we're just going to leave it there. If something was like too loud, then you might have to turn the gain down, but this is good. This is fine. We want to be almost reaching the yellows, just not reaching the reds, and just a little bit above this. So this is fine for now. So now, to turn this up in the main speaker, all we have to do is just make sure that we have the front of house mix, the left-right mix selected, and uh, check, 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 turn it up here. Now we're coming out of the main speaker. It's as easy as that. We can turn that back down and now say we want to send it to our monitor one here. So remember we have this plugged into stage right, monitor one, mix one is going to this. So in order to do that, we select push monitor one send on the right side of the mixer and then we just turn it up into that mix. Check, check, check. Now I can hear that it's coming out of the speaker behind me. And it's as simple as that, just routing one input to different places. So we have monitor and main, and we could do both of them at the same time so the performer on stage can hear themselves and we can hear them in the audience. Check, 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 and then we can turn it off. Okay, so we found out how to route sends, route inputs to different sends, all of our monitors or our main. We also have effects that work the same way with a slight different twist. So the monitor sends are what's called a pre-fader send. So that means that these are not affected by the position of the main channel fader. So I can turn this up in the monitor and it goes up in the monitor. However, these effect sends are post fader sends. What that means is they require the main fader to be turned up to a certain degree in order for anything to be 
coming out of that sin. So I could turn this all the way up and you don't hear anything, you don't hear any reverb certainly, there's no, no voice coming through. But when I turn up the channel in the mains, now I'm in a cave. Uh, because that reverb send happens after the main fader. So it only comes through if this fader is up. And that's what we want. Because otherwise, if you turn your vocal channel all the way down, you would still hear that reverb coming through. We don't want that. We want to turn them both up and down at the same time. Uh, but that's a ton of reverb. We don't want that much. We can turn that off. We can have less reverb of the same type. Or, to get into our reverb settings, we can have this send selected. We can have the send selected and then select the actual mix send here. And that brings up our reverb setting. Or, another way to get to the reverb setting, instead of doing selecting that, if we have our channel selected still, we just push FX up here. And now we have all of our FX units, including FX1. So maybe we don't like this big cave sound for our reverb. We want something else. So we push the library button and we can choose a different reverb. So that was massive, all massive. We want uh, chamber large. Sure, that sounds good. Recall, check, check. Okay, now if I give myself some more of that reverb, now we're in a large chamber. It's a little bit smaller than the massive hall. Uh, we can also go in and fine tune specifically the delay time, but tons of other parameters. So I can make this a shorter delay time with the same other parameters. And that's kind of cool. It's a lot shorter. It's more like an echo almost. It's got a pre delay on it, and it's got a very short reverb. Same thing with delay, it works exactly the same. So, turn that off. We're, we're done with the reverb. Delay is exactly the same. That's FX2 if you're doing here. If you do that, you, same thing. We're going to send to the delay. Check. Check, 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 check. Now you can now hear some delays. 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 This tap, this tap delay, 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 delay will determine the frequency of the delay. Check, 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 check. check. Check, 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 check. So you can imagine if a band is playing and they're playing a beat. You can make it match. So that's really useful and fun. So delays and reverbs and effects are really cool for changing the tone and making things sound really cool and neat. But if somebody's just speaking like I am right now, you don't want you me, don't to, want be, me uh, to be uh, echoing uh, out like out this. Out like so in so between in songs, songs, maybe I've got the reverb on too. too. I'm just, uh, just uh, all, all kinds, kinds of kinds wet, wet, wet over wet, here wet, with effects. Wet, 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 wet. So I'm not gonna go into the individual fader and like turn these down or mute the uh, send in between songs, I'm going to use the mute group for mute FX right there. That mutes both of our channel, both of our effects sends. That way we're not getting any more of that. Notice I said it mutes the sends. It doesn't mute the returns. So if I say something and it's still trailing off and I push the button, it doesn't just instantly disappear. It stays until it naturally fades out. So I'll demonstrate that. Check, 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 check. So you notice the effect was still going, but I had pushed the button. So check, 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 check. It's just not adding more. So that's good because it can naturally trail out and it's not really an issue that much, but it's just a difference in muting the sends versus the returns.
All right, so still on effects, we are going to talk about effects returns. So we have the effect sends. We remember how that works. It just is a, is a regular mix. We can send to it. I'm going to reset that effect to a different one. I'm going to pick a uh, EMT large. Recall that reverb preset. Check, check, check. check. Cool. So, reverb works like that. You turn it up and it's good. But, you're only seeing half of the story here. You see that we're sending the input channel to the reverb send. But, we need that return, the reverb return, to actually hear the sound. So, FX returns are on our second layer. So we have to push this button, which will change our display. Our faders now are displaying the second layer with the blue LED, which includes stereo inputs and FX returns right here. FX1, FX2 return. So what that is, is it's basically an additional input channel that is only handling the return from the FX units. So there's one for FX1, one for FX2. So when I speak and you hear the reverb, it's really kind of low, so you don't see any signal, but if I select that, go to processing, that's where it's coming in. So if I turn this down, check, 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 now you don't hear it coming through the mains, however, it is coming out the monitor. So. Why would we want that? Why would we want that? Why do we want to have that, the ability to send two monitors and both things? Good question, Lucky. Um, well... Because back in the day, we really didn't do that. Yeah, well, the singer might want to hear them reverb themselves. And they might rely on that sound to have a better performance. And they might just really like hearing the reverb. A lot of singers do. So we have separate controls. And once again, this is, it might seem complicated, but it works just like any other channel. So FX return one is being sent to the mains in this amount, unity. FX return one is being sent to monitor one in this amount. So if I go back to the main mix, I turn off FX return one. So now you hear it only in the monitor, and now I go to the monitor and turn off X, FX return one. Now the reverb's gone everywhere. No reverb, nowhere. So usually we have in our default setting, the FX returns are about minus five dB on every monitor, and in the mains, they're at zero. That's, That's FX, FX returns. returns. And, and always, always remember, remember mute, mute FX, FX key right there mutes all the effects. That's what you want to do when people are talking. So, uh, you might notice a difference in audio because we were using this for our camera recording for this video. So now it says, it's now safe to turn off your QU16. So we can do that by pushing the button on the back or flipping the switch on the power strip in here. And there we go. We turned it off. The reason it does that, it has that special procedure, is because it needs to make sure that all the scene data and anything that's changed is saved into its memory. And so that the only reason that it has that particular shutoff procedure is it's just like, oh, is anything pending to write to memory? Yes, finish writing it. Okay, now turn off. Otherwise, turning it off is not going to hurt anything. It would just go back to the default, right? It saves the state that it's in. Whatever state it's in, oh. whenever you turn it off, it's the next time you turn it on, it's in that state. So that's why it's important when we first power up to load the default scene because who knows what may have been even if it looks like everything's flat who knows what might have happened so you fire up and you go to default 
and that'll restore it to what you originally had programmed. Yep. Okay. So we'll, we'll do that again just briefly here. So we're turning it on. So now this is in, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to set all these faders and just like screw it up. And now I'm going to turn it off. We can turn it off the right way or we can turn it off the wrong way. I'm going to turn it off the wrong way because why not? Lost power, great, whatever. Turn it back on. Everything's in the same place. So if you start up, you just got it out of the box and you're starting up a show, I don't, I can't work with this. Like who knows what's messed up? And like even if these are all flat, who knows what parameters, maybe there's an EQ that's in a really weird place. So it's very important to load the scene because even if the faders are all down and it looks like everything is in the default position, there's so many hidden screens of processing and EQs and mixing and just like so many different things that can be changed that it's very important that we start in the same place. So we want to make sure to load our default scene every time. So to do so, we push the scenes button on the screen. So now we're on our scenes view and we just select our default scene, either default local using the local inputs on the mixer if we're not using the digital snake or default D snake if we do have the D snake set up. So we're going to recall that. Recall scene, default D snake, continue. Yes, please. And now it loaded. Uh, that might not have been clear because the faders didn't do anything, but everything resets. So I'm going to do it again. Push the fader to load. Default scene. Good to go. All right. And now to turn it off again, go to home screen, home, the shutdown. Yes. So now save to turn off your Q16. Go ahead flip the power switch. And we're going to pack this back up. So we just ran a successful show. Uh, the audience loved it. I got a standing ovation. It was great. And we're ready to pack up. So the first thing we're going to do in taking down our sound system is we're going to turn off our speakers because the amplifier is built in if we turn off our mixer and these amplifiers are still on, they're going to make a loud popping sound. It's going to be bad for the speakers, it's going to be bad for us, and it just looks bad. So turning off the speakers, just hit the switch on the back. They're all off. We can now turn off the mixer. So this line right here, keep clear to close. Nothing can be stored beneath there because the case will not close. The mixer actually goes right there. So we have to make sure that everything, the iPad, the bag with the tape and the brush in it, and our power cable get stored above that line. So we got this one wrapped up. Velcro goes above the line. Now we can fold the case back in. So to do this, we just have to pick it up a little bit, pull these pins out, and then it'll fold right down. And now you can see why that stuff couldn't be there. So the next step is we're gonna grab the lid and put the lid on. This is a little tricky. You have to line up these two little pins to the hinge. Put the lid. Oh, by the way, if you ever get completely lost, the uh, user guide for the mixer is in the lid underneath the foam where the legs are stored. So that user guide is what came with the mixer. It's an old firmware version, so it's a little bit out of date, but it might be helpful. Okay, so we're not finished because the legs are still on. We just had to close it up. To set it down so we can take the legs off. So just like we screwed them on, unscrew the legs. And 
and now the legs have to go back inside the case. So, set it down, open up the lid, and now they're going to tuck in on top of this foam. They have to go at a diagonal angle because they don't fit otherwise. Okay, they're in there, everything closes up, latches are closed, stand it up on its wheels, and the mixer is good to go back in the truck, ready for the next show. Thank you.